Hello, my name is Bing Wen. Uh, I'm the Director of Research and Development at TGS Nopac. In the next 20 minutes, I will talk about least squares reverse time migration. Before I start my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at TGS, Su Qiandong and San Sa. They make uh, great contributions to this work. Here is the outline of this presentation. First, I will describe what is least square RTM. Then I show you some synthetic data examples and use them to illustrate the benefit of this square RTM as compared with the conventional RTM. Then I will talk about field data application and discuss some of the challenges and the practical solutions and finally reach some conclusions. What is this square RTM? Simply speaking, this square RTM is a depth imaging algorithm. As the name implies, it is based on two-way wave equation. But unlike the conventional RTM, which is adjoint operator, this square RTM is inversion-based imaging algorithm, and the main objective of this square RTM is to get a better reflectivity image. This square RTM is a special form of least square migration. In mathematical term, this square migration try to find the reflectivity image M from seismic D, which minimizes the following misfit function. Here D is observed seismic data, and LM is modeled seismic data. Here L is wave propagator. Just to refresh your memory, to get this square solution, first we need to set up a linear system in matrix form. Then we multiply both sides of the equation by LT. Then on the left side, you have this uh, square matrix called the Hessian matrix. Then performing the inverse of this Hessian matrix, you get this square solution. Next, let's compare this square migration with conventional migration. As we know, for conventional migration, the migration operator is adjoint operator, it's not inverse. Therefore, we are imagine there's some migration artifact due to acquisition footprint or due to non-uniform illumination, it may also have um, amplitude error for migration. For this square RTM compared with conventional RTM, now you have this additional term, which is inverse of Hessian matrix, therefore make it inversion-based imaging algorithm. Because of this inverse Hessian, is able to remove or reduce the migration artifact due to acquisition footprint or due to non-uniform illumination. And it also cracks for the migration amplitude errors. And also this inverse of Hashem also serves as the blurting filter which make regular migration higher resolution. And there's two categories of implementation. One is in data domain, one is in model domain. Here is a list of reference for this study. Even though this is accurate, however, Hashem matrix is huge. In practice, especially in 3D, it's almost impossible to get accurate inverse. Typically, people searching for approximate inverse. So in our implementation of least square RTM, we choose iterative, gradient-based local search algorithm. Here, L is two-way wave propagator. In our iterative solution, the initial solution is just a regular RTM. Here, LT is RTM operator. However, this square RTM not stop at the regular RTM image. It go on with the iterative image updating loop. We use the migration image as the reflectivity image to perform ball modeling, you get LM. Then combined with input data, you get data residual. Therefore, as long as there's signal in the data residual, you can calculate this gradient, which is RTM operation on this data residual. Then you add details to your final image. Here is flowchart for least square RTM. First of all, you have input data in short record. You perform RTM image. You get just get conventional RTM. As I mentioned, least square RTM not stopping here. You go on the next iterative image updating loop. You use the migration image as reflectivity model 
you perform ball modeling, you get a synthetic data. Then combine with input data, you get data residual. So as long as there's remaining signal in the data residual, you can update the image. By doing RTM operation on this data residual, you get gradient, which is additional residual image you can add into your final image. Because of this additional loop, you add more details to your final image. There is some similarity of least square RTM with full waveform inversion. First of all, both full waveform inversion and least square RTM are inversion-based algorithm, and both try to make model the data fit observed data. However, there is some major difference. First of all, the objective is different. The objective for waveform inversion is try to get a better velocity model. But here, least square RTM is not trying to update the velocity model. Instead, it tried to derive a better reflectivity image itself. And secondly, full waveform inversion is nonlinear inversion because each iteration you change your velocity, therefore you change your wave path. But this square RTM, you use the same velocity model during this image updating. Therefore, wave has not changed its linear inversion. And thirdly, the forward modeling is different. The full waveform inversion forward modeling is based on medium property, either velocity model or density model. But here, this square RTM is based on reflectivity model. Typically, the initial reflectivity model is based on your migration image. Therefore, your modeling is kind of demigration. Migration and demigration use the same velocity model, therefore make it less sensitive for the velocity model, at least for near offset. However, for far offset, if velocity model is in error, you still have misalignment between model event and observed event. This RTM is approached towards true amplitude and high resolution image. Next, I'll show you some synthetic data example. This is famous Mamusi dataset. This is a velocity model. Here is reflectivity model. Here the black represents the positive reflectivity and white represents the negative reflectivity. Here is a regular RTM image. It is a pretty good image. However, if you look carefully, the amplitude on the top on the shallow is brighter than the deep. And also on the left side, the amplitude is dimmed. Here is this square RTM image after 20 iteration. First of all, you can see the amplitude is more balanced from top to bottom, left to right, because it was true amplitude. Secondly, it gives high resolution. You can see the fault is sharper. And also, for each layer, you start to see the detailed stratigraphy. Again, regular RTM, this square RTM. And thirdly, this square RTM gives you broadband image. Let's look at, let's say, one of the boundary. For example, you have black boundary. Just pick any of the boundary. Compare with regular, compare with regular RTM. It's still black, but look carefully. Both sides are black, you have white side lobe. Then this square RTM, you only have black, which means it suppress the side lobe. And also because of suppressing side lobe, it gives you a broadband image looking. Typically, it's like 3D texture effect. You see some layer looks like plateau, some layer looks like a valley. Compared with true reflectivity, it's good match. Let's compare the spectrum. The green color is RTM spectrum, and the red color curve is least square RTM spectrum. You can see least square RTM give you broader spectrum, especially towards the low frequency. Now let's look at why low frequency is so important. On the left is a, a wavelet, a set of wavelets. On the right are the uh, spectrum corresponding to each wavelet. Let's look at the first wavelet. It is narrow band, 16 to 30 hertz. You can see the side lobe is about the same magnitude as the main peak. If you expand the low frequency from 16 to 8, now you can see side lobe is reduced to about half. Further increase low frequency to 4 hertz, now side lobe become one third. How about the high frequency? If we increase from high frequency from 32 to 64 to 128, you can see wavelet is squeezed. Typically high frequency give you vertical resolution. Let's compare again RTM image 
least square RTM image. You can see least square image, least square RTM image give you broadband image. Okay, here is another synthetic model. We have this is velocity model with two sort of body. Here is a reflectivity model, and here is conventional RTM image. We can see in sub sort area, especially in this shadow area right below the base of sort, you can see RTM does not give good image. And it also contaminated by a lot of migration artifacts. Here is this square RTM image. Clearly, it is significantly improved the subsort image in this shadow area. And compared with the regular RTM, this this square RTM also remove at least reduce a lot of migration artifact. Next, I will talk about field data example. First of all, let's discuss some of the challenges for field data application. First of all, wave propagator is not accurate. We know wave propagation through the real earth is very complex. It is even beyond viscoelastic. However, our wave simulation is based on acoustic wave propagator. Therefore, it is not able to account those converted wave. It is not account attenuation. And also, the amplitude is not accurate. And secondly, to get a good broadband image, we need to have accurate source wavelet. And thirdly, we need to have a true velocity, we need to have accurate velocity model in order to get a good result. Even though, as I mentioned, for near offset is not a big concern because the migration and the re-migration cancel each other, even though you have lost errors. However, for far offset, if velocity model is in error, the model the wavelet will not match, will not align with observed wavelet. What's the practical solution? First of all, we need to have a good source wave estimation in order to have those decon effect, in order to have good broadband image. And secondly, in order to reduce the wave propagate errors, we need to do two things. First of all, we need to do pre-processing of the observed data. If in the case, there is some complex wave mode which is not able to be modeled, we need to either remove it or reduce it. And secondly, we can also scale our modeled seismic to match the observed seismic in order to reduce the amplitude errors. And also, if velocity is in error, as I mentioned, for far offset large angle, the event may not be lined up. If the event not lined up, when you compute data residual, you have trouble. Therefore, we typically apply a minor matching filter to align the modeled wavelet with observed wavelet before you compute the data residual. Therefore, in this case, we modify our misfit function from equation 1 to equation 2. In front of this observed data, we apply the pre-processing. In front of this model data, we apply matching filter. Next, show you the real data example. Here is the short record of observed data. Here is model data. Compared with real data, this model data match pretty well. The next is the data residual after first iteration. First of all, this is the difference between your first modeling, which is based on your RTM image. Compared with the input data, data residual amplitude much reduced, which means majority of the energy is utilized to create this RTM image. However, you can see this data residual still have a lot of useful signal, which is not utilized or not effectively utilized by regular RTM image. But this least square RTM allows you to have iterative image updating. Here is after second iteration, you can see the signal level is reduced. Therefore, more signal is added back to your final image. After five iteration, you have further reduced the residual. Therefore, this iterative image updating allow you to pick up those weak signal, add more details to your final image. Now let's compare the regular image and the least square RTM image. This is regular RTM, this least square RTM. On the first look, it's not very impressive. However, if you look at carefully, let's say on the left arrow, there is a steep dipping to the left of fault. If you look at the regular RTM, it's not clear. And on the right side, 
you can see the this graph TM give you this broadband image looking. It's blockiness, it has 3D texture. Compare with regular TM, this graph TM. It not only sharpen the fault and also sharpen the layer boundary, give you higher resolution vertically and laterally. Another example, in the error indicate location, this regular TM image, we are not sure if there is fault. Here is a least square TM. In the least square TM, you can see clearly there is a fault defined. Next example, regular TM. Again, in the location, this error indicating. Regular TM is not sure how far this fault extends. This is least square RTM. It clearly defined this fault. And also in the highlight area, compare regular TM, this square TM. This square TM gives you far higher resolution. It gives you decon effect. Next example, this is regular RTM. You can see in this regular RTM, the deep portion, the amplitude is much weaker. This is this square RTM. First of all, this square RTM gives you more balanced amplitude because it towards true amplitude. And also in the shallow area, in this highlight shallow area, compared with regular TM, this square TM. You can see this square TM give you high resolution and a decon effect. And also this square TM improve the steep dip image on this sort of boundary. Here is the final example. This is regular TM, this is this square TM. The same story you can see, the this square TM is able to image steep dip much better. And it also gives you high resolution, both vertically and laterally. Let's look at in more detail on this, the second error location. You can see there's event termination. However, in the regular TM, it's not clear. In the least graph TM, event termination is so sharp, it stops at fault. The reason for that is, anytime you have termination event, you have diffraction energy. However, this square TM, uh, the regular RTM is not able to pick this weak diffraction energy. Only using this square TM, the later iteration, you are able to pick up this diffraction energy and create a sharp event termination. In conclusion, this square RTM is an inversion-based imaging algorithm. In 3D inversion, it provides you an image domain broadband solution. And uh, this square RTM is able to effectively broaden the low frequency spectrum. With more low frequency, it's able to suppress side lobe. By suppressing the strong side lobe, some of the weak detail signals show up. And also by suppressed side lobe, the layer boundary is sharper. And it's able to pr produce the 3D texture effect, give you broadband image looking. And also because of this high resolution, uh, because of this uh, iterative approach, is able to pick up the weak event in the later iteration. Therefore, it improved the lateral resolution, just like the example we show some event termination is better towards the fault. And uh, also because it's inversion based, it's able to improve image in the shadow area with poor illumination and suppress migration artifact. And it's algorithm towards true amplitude and therefore it's good for future 4D seismic imaging. But in order to get good broadband image, we need to have good source wavelength estimation and accurate velocity model. So I'd like to thank our TGS colleagues from both production side and the R&D side. In particular, we like to thank Chen Zhong, Jin Ji, and Simon Bordo for their contribution. We thank TGS management for permission to present this work Thank you for your attention.